Welcome to episode number three for our Biology One ECA review series. And this episode is going to deal with our third standard, which is matter cycles and energy transfers. Think of chapters two, chapters eight, chapters nine, and chapter three. So let's get on with it. All right, the core standard, or let me rephrase this, the first core standard is describe how the sun's energy is captured and used to construct sugar molecules that can be used as a form of energy and to serve as a building box for other chemical reactions. And as you can see on the screen here, we have the balanced chemical equation for photosynthesis. Six carbon dioxide molecules uh, will be joined with six water molecules with the help of light, and that will form sugar and oxygen as a waste product. All right, now a couple things I want to write down in here real quick. Remember, this is going to be created during the Calvin cycle. This is going to be created during the light dependent reaction. This is going to be created during the Calvin cycle. And this is going to be created during the light dependent reaction. And remember, if you want to balance the equation, you need a six, six and a six in front of everything but the sugar molecule because sugar's too sweet to be devilish. Six, 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 mark of the beast. All right, let's get rid of that and let's move on. All right, so let's look at, um, for this standard, 3.1, so standard B, 3.1, really deals with photosynthesis in a little bit more detail. As you saw on the previous screen, I talked about the light-dependent reactions and the light-independent reactions, which are also known as the Calvin cycle. All right? Now, in the light-dependent reaction, you're going to use chlorophyll to capture the energy from sunlight. Remember, chlorophyll looks like a magnesium lollipop. Light hits the magnesium, and an electron pops off. Now, these high-energy electrons that come off of the chlorophyll they're going to be used to make ATP, and some of those energy um, electrons are going to move on to the Calvin cycle. Basically, those two products are going to help uh, power it. Now, water is produced. I'm just going to rephrase that one. Uh, water is used in this step, and it's going to be used to produce uh, oxygen as a waste product. And this occurs on the thylakoid membrane, which are the green little poker chips inside a chloroplast. The Calvin cycle is going to uh, occur in the stroma, which is the inner liquid part of the chloroplast. And it's here where carbon dioxide is going to be turned into sugars. And the power for that is going to come from the ATP and the high energy electrons that are found uh, or that were made by the uh, light dependent reaction. So I'm going to zoom in here on the picture down below. And I really want you to, whoops, hit that wrong button there. I want you to pay attention to this stuff right here. Oh, I'll change my color. Let's go with purple. All right. So these are the thylakoid membranes, these little green poker chips. So light is going to hit this, and then some electrons are going to jump off. These electrons are picked up by an electron carrier called NADPH. Some of those electrons are used to make uh, ATP. And these two things are going to supply the power to make the Calvin cycle work out here in the stroma. So when water is broken in half, it's going to replace the electrons that were lost by chlorophyll, and your waste product is going to be oxygen. All right. Now, during the Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to move in. And it, using some ATP and these high energy electrons, you're going to turn these carbon dioxides into a sugar molecule. And that is photosynthesis in a keep it simple version. Now, go back to chapter eight series of videos if you want to learn more of the details of uh, uh, photosynthesis. All right, standard B3.2 is basically dealing with cellular respiration. Now, in our class, we learn more of the details about cellular respiration than was required by the standards. But I'm okay with that because if you understand these details, you're going to get the big general picture that the standard asks for. Okay, now, cellular respiration can also be known as aerobic respiration because aerobic means you're using oxygen during the process. Now, there's three main steps to cellular or aerobic respiration. Number one of them is called glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm, and what happens during glycolysis is you take glucose and you break it in half. When you break it in half, 
you're going to create a little bit of ATP and you're going to create some high energy electrons and these hydrogen electrons are going to move into the mitochondria and be used later. Okay. Now glycolysis is typically, I may rephrase this one, it's technically an anaerobic process because it doesn't require oxygen. You can do it without oxygen. Now the next two steps occur inside the mitochondria, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Both of these are considered aerobic because you have to use oxygen to make them happen. Now the Krebs cycle is going to occur in the matrix of the mitochondria and what happens in this one is uh, the leftovers from glycolysis are further broken down. That's going to create a waste product called carbon dioxide and it's going to create a lot of these high energy electrons that are going to continue to move over to the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain is by far the most important step of cellular respiration. This occurs on that folded inner membrane and those high energy electrons that we made during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, they're going to be put to use in this step. And what happens in this step is basically you're going to use some oxygen and that oxygen is going to help move this electron transport chain so that you can make lots and lots of ATP, which is the energy transfer molecule for living things. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor and you're going to make lots of ATP. All right, so I'm going to pay attention over here to these pictures that we have up here at, uh, on this slide. So if you notice, C6 H12O6, that's sugar, six O2s yields six carbon dioxides and six water molecules. This is the complete opposite of photosynthesis. So cellular respiration, of which this uh, is right here, is the complete opposite chemically of photosynthesis. Now I'm going to zoom in down here on this picture of the mitochondria, and you notice that we have three main steps to cellular respiration. Glycolysis, which occurs out in the cytoplasm, you make a little bit of ATP, but the main thing that you're making is high energy electrons that are moving into the mitochondria. And you're going to make some pyruvic acid, which will move into the Krebs cycle. Now in the Krebs cycle, you're going to break down this pyruvic acid. You're going to make a little bit of ATP. The most important thing you're making are more high energy electrons, and you're producing the waste product of CO2. Now these high energy electrons that we've made in one, two places, are going to power this electron transport system. And you notice that this starburst of ATP is much bigger because most of the ATP is being made by the electron transport chain. And as a waste product, you're going to have CO2. So if we go back up into here, this sugar, this one's used during glycoly glycolysis, glycolysis if you want to help spell it. Okay, the uh, Oxygen is going to be used during the electron transport chain. The carbon dioxide is going to be produced during the Krebs. And then the water is going to be produced during the electron transport chain. And then ATP is made by all steps. But most of it is going to be made during the electron transport chain. Okay? This is Chapter 9 stuff. If you want more details on this, see my Chapter 9 uh, series of videos. All right, let's move right along. All right, standard 3.3 is talking about metabolism. As you see down here at the bottom in pink, metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions that occur in your body. Now, living things have two types of reactions. There's the anabolic slash endergonic, and there's the catabolic slash exergonic. Now, anabolic means that you require energy, so you're going to be taking in energy. So think of endergonic taking in energy. Now you're going to be building molecules in this one. So think of dehydration synthesis. You're taking your monomers and you're linking them together. Now another way to remember what anabolic means is ana builds. Ana builds molecules and that takes energy. Now catabolic reactions are going to break things. Think of the cat breaks. So these molecules that were made by an anabolic process, they're going to be broken by a catabolic process. Now the exergonic means that energy is going to exit. So these are releasing energy. Okay. So let's zoom in here on this picture. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now this one over here is an exergonic reaction. And you'll notice that your reactants are up here. They got a decent amount of energy. And your products have a lower amount of energy. 
So what happened here was energy was released. Now you see this little hump right here? Basically from this area to that area? This is the activation energy, so E sub A. This is the energy that's required to get it started, okay? Ender let me rephrase this one. Um, exergonic reactions are typically spontaneous. They'll get started pretty easy, and then off they go, all right? Now, an endergonic reaction is just the opposite. The activation energy is so high that it has a hard time getting started. So look over at this guy. The reactants have low energy, but the products have higher energy. So we have to add in some energy. So energy is being added. Now, from here to there, so remember from the peak of this hump, this is the activation energy. So it takes a ton of activation energy to get this going. That's why this reaction doesn't occur typically on its own. It usually needs help. And in typically in a living thing, the helper molecule is going to be an enzyme because they're going to lower the activation energy. And we'll cover that in a different video. All right. Now, core standard number two talks about how matter and kind of energy, think food, are going to move throughout an, uh, an ecosystem. Now, remember chapter three was where all this comes from. So chapter three, we talked about food chains and food webs. Now, over here in this picture is simply the basic structure of a biogeochemical cycle where waters move, um, materials are moving from water into the land, um, between water and the atmosphere, the land and the atmosphere, the atmosphere, water, and land with living things, and we have volcanoes going in here. So think of your biogeochemical cycles of carbon cycle, water cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle. Um, that's what we're talking about. All right, so uh, standard B34 deals with food chains and food webs, and this is typically very simple. Uh, a food chain is a list of who eats who, now, I do want to remind you that each spot is called a trophic level. A trophic level is your place in the food chain, all right? So all food chains start with a producer here at the bottom, a plant typically, but it could be an algae, it could be a photosynthetic bacteria, and the plant is going to be eaten by an herbivore, which is a type of consumer that eats plants, and then the herbivore will be eaten by a consumer or some type of carnivore that's going to eat the, like in this case, the mouse is eating the insect. And then finally, we have another, a higher level uh, consumer that's going to eat the first level consumer. So if we were going to put some, some numbers in here, okay, this would be the first trophic level, second trophic, third trophic, and the fourth level. And when we talk about the uh, energy periods in a previous uh, cast, um, or I think it actually comes up on this one, uh, you're going to learn why there's only about four levels. Okay. Now, a food web is basically a bunch of interconnected food chains. So you can see how there's more than one thing that can eat a grasshopper. That's what makes it a web. All right. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's the pyramids. All right, standard B 3.5 deals with ecological pyramids. Now, I want you to pay attention right here on this blue stuff. Ecological pyramids pretty much are looking at the amount of energy or the amount of stuff that's available at each trophic level in a food chain or food web. All right? And ecological pyramids come in three different flavors. Number one is the pyramid of energy. And this one's the most important because as we go up a trophic level, there's less and less energy available. So the first trophic level has the highest amount of energy available to it. Only 10% can move on to the next level. Okay? The pyramid of numbers tells you that there's less and less individuals at each trophic level. So the first trophic level is going to have the most people. Well, why? It has the most energy. And as by the time you get to the top, you have less energy, so therefore there's going to be less individuals. And then the biomass pyramid... The biomass pyramid simply says that there's less stuff at each trophic level. All right. So if we look over here, you have 100% energy here. Only 10% of that energy is available to this one. 10% of one of a one. Let me rephrase this. 10% of, 
of 10% is 1%, and then 10% of 1% is 1 tenth. So you notice that we're going to have less energy at the top. Now, which means that we're going to have pyramidal numbers, lots of producers, lots of the first, um, uh, not very many first-level consumers, secondary consumers, and your tertiary consumers, they're going to have the lowest one. You're going to have more biomass here, less here, less here, less here. So these are all connected because it's due to the amount of energy that's available. All right, that's going to, uh, that's going to end this episode. All right. Kind of a pretty easy standard, I think. Uh, it's dealing with some basic chapters. Now, the one thing that you want to go back and maybe look at would be the chapter 8 and 9 stuff about photosynthesis and um, uh, respiration. So, until next time, we're going to catch you on that flip side.